Welcome back to Compound Thesis. Our guest today is Austin Diamond. He's the co-founder and CEO at Alongside. And prior to Alongside, Austin led operations at an early stage VC fund. On the show today, we're going to explore developments in crypto indices, why passive strategies can make investing in digital assets more efficient, and how Alongside's AMKT index fund lays the foundation for future financial products. Austin, welcome to the show. Jim, thanks for having me. Super excited about it. Yeah, man. So before we uh, dive in, for those that are not familiar with Alongside, can you just give us a little bit of background on the firm? And, and you know, I think what's really interesting is actually the origin story behind it. Yeah, absolutely. Excited to get into that. So, you know, for context, we describe ourselves as the decentralized vanguard, or at least that's certainly the uh, goal. Um, what we mean by that is we want to build, you know, on-chain index products designed to enable total market and you know, eventually thematic exposure to different categories in crypto. You know, as far as the origin story, you know, I, I like to joke that, uh, you know, degenerate trading is kind of the gateway drug to responsible investing. And, you know, I myself uh, as a kid was just obsessed with all kinds of exotic financial products that I frankly knew nothing about. Um, and, you know, was lucky enough to end up uh, getting a job, you know, basically fetching coffee with someone that managed a portfolio of equity index funds. And so their whole strategy was, you know, we buy markets, not companies. And I got exposed to this idea that, you know, most active managers don't outperform a simple benchmark. So, you know, what does that mean? All of the, you know, hotshot hedge fund managers that maybe are clogging the airwaves at CNBC, by and large, don't beat like the taxi driver that just bought, uh, you know, SPY and held for their whole career. And so to me, you know, index products are like this great equalizer for regular people to get exposure to markets. And I think a lot more people would be invested in markets if they realized that it doesn't have to be so overcomplicated. Um, and so, you know, fast forward 10 years, you know, I saw things like compound kickoff DeFi summer. And, you know, it just felt like, um, you know, my head was spinning around all the different things that were being built, you know, all in a pretty condensed period of time. And, you know, I feel like I could tell you that I think, you know, on-chain lending uh, and lending markets like compound were going to be, you know, big winners. Did I know whether, you know, you all or Ave was going to be the winner or, you know, is... Sushi going to beat Uniswap or every four seconds, there was a new, uh, you know, kind of DeFi protocol being built. There was idle finance and there was Yearn. It was like, you know, head spinning. And so in a lot of ways, wanted to just build this product for myself um, and, you know, kind of apply the same principles of equity investing where, you know, if you just buy the market, you tend to outperform active picking. I suck at stock trading. I also stuck at, you know, token trading. And I just wanted the, you know, passive product that lets me get exposure to the growth of the whole category. So that's sort of how this all began. Yeah. So, I mean, also, like, how did you get together with your team? Because you've got, you know, uh, a pretty diverse uh, co-founders. Just like, how did you guys all get together? Yeah, absolutely. So we got to know each other years ago at a company called Omni, which was a complete roller coaster, but attracted some of the best people and, and best friends, uh, you know, I'll ever work with. And my co-founder Gote actually started as my intern there. I, I joke, but like totally true in all of four seconds, completely lapped me in skills. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was, you know, very much excited to work with him again. Um, June, our head of engineering at the time, uh, was, you know, one of the lead engineers there. And Rai, um, our, our final co-founder, you know, spent the prior several years at uh, Consensus working on Ethereum. And, you know, I think that all of us had gotten together and, and you know, at least those of us that were at Omni wanted to work together again you know, started to tinker with this. And then it became clear that this is something that, you know, we felt like we could devote uh, the foreseeable future and, you know, potentially the rest of our lives to. So that's how it all began. Yeah, no, it's great. And and kind of going back to your original, um, you know, anecdote about not being able to trade the market. I mean, especially given how uh, volatile the asset class is that we're in and, you know, just how diverse uh, all of the individual uh, projects, tokens, um, you know, there's just so many different sectors to pay attention to and then idiosyncratic stories behind each one of them. So uh, it really takes professional management uh, to be spending all day, every day uh, managing those assets. And and for, you know, your regular uh, investor that's looking to get exposure, um, what is it? What's the saying? You know, time in the market is better than timing the market. And, you know, it's 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 a tried and true method of low cost, passive index investing that's, you know, oftentimes allowed people to outperform uh, trying to be creative or or too aggressive with their investment strategy. Now, there's definitely a bell curve here, right, where, um, you know, folks on the right tail of it will, um, you know, do very well in this type of a market structure because they're spending a lot of time doing the, you know, the research, but for your average everyday investor that, you know, 80 to 90% that's in the middle of the bell curve, you know, just getting exposure to a broad market index 
is a way better way of getting, um, you know, of investing their capital and their time. <laughs> and then, you know, as you alluded to, which we'll dive into in a bit, it's like the ability to get different thematic exposures within that, um, you know, is really interesting for, for folks to kind of build a, uh, a, a diversified portfolio uh, versus trying to, um, you know, outperform a benchmark by actively managing individual in investments. Totally. But I think most people, you know, don't want to sit in every discord, be glued to Twitter notifications and, you know, follow the mechanics of every individual's product. And I think, you know, funnily enough, like even those that do, um, you know, I, I'll be the first to tell you, I don't think this is a perfectly efficient market. I should be laughing sure. in the room if I, if I told you that given the backdrop of like frog. Pepe. Yeah. Jumping <laughs> a billion dollars in market cap. But, uh, you know, even among those that I think are, are, you know, perhaps skilled traders, I think, you know, one thing that's just frustrating about markets generally is that, like, ordinarily, you know, you're trained to believe that, you know, inputs equate to outputs and, and you know, effort ultimately equates to, you know, better outcomes. In markets, unfortunately, and this is a super frustrating thing, you know, generally speaking, you're rewarded for inaction. Right. And, you know, patience. And I think that, you know, that's certainly frustrating for me is like I could pour over every white paper and still not have alpha, you know, over the market. Um, and so I think, you know, for most people that don't want to spend their, you know, entire days, uh, you know, tracking the ins and outs of everything, getting exposure to the whole market uh, is just a simple way to set it and forget it. Yeah. So, I mean, in TradFi, like the rise of low cost passive index investing has become like extremely popular, obviously, with the rise of you mentioned, you know, Vanguard and just the entire industry has really taken off. So can you, you know, from your vantage point, like why has crypto investors, like whether they're retail or institutional, not followed the same strategy? Totally. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think there are a couple of things. One, it wasn't until recently, at least in my mind that the asset class was mature enough that you actually wanted index exposure. So, you know, in my mind, they were really, you know, rolling up to a couple of assets up until about 2020. And, you know, what I, I'm personally really excited about is actually looking at, you know, protocols like Compound and the way that they actually generate real revenue or there's real, you know, economic value being produced by many of these, you know, application layer protocols. And so, you know, it wasn't really until 2020 or so that in my mind, you actually had a robust enough ecosystem to support the idea of indexing. Um, and then I think that, you know, a lot of the things that have held this back are, are definitely cultural, right? Like I think in crypto, generally speaking, there's a ton of tribalism around at least specifically, you know, certain layer one protocols. Obviously, you've got things like Bitcoin maximalism. You've got a lot of people in the Ethereum community that think that, you know, everything will roll up to Ethereum. I think, you know, all those may be true. Uh, you know, only time will tell. But I do think that, uh, you know, really now is the time where it just makes sense to get, you know, broader exposure. Um, you know, I, I think that one thing to kind of, you know, talk against our own book for, for a second is just that I do think that, you know, on a five, 10 year time horizon, the idea of a total market fund for crypto assets won't make as much sense because you've got assets that are designed to be stores of value and currencies. You've got smart contract protocols that will have, you know, kind of economic value occurring in totally different ways. And then you've got the application layer that I think, you know, probably mirrors, uh, you know, equities, uh, you know, more closely, at least than those other two. And, you know, kind of casting a single broad stroke may not always make sense. Um, but I really think that, you know, the, the lack of index products in the space to date have just been a function of immaturity in the market. And, you know, like I said, it's not a perfectly efficient market either. Um, but I, I think that's almost emblematic of why you might want to have indexed exposure is, you know, you don't need to be on top of Twitter to make sure that you caught the latest frog coin. Um, and so, you know, that, that's kind of the thinking is I think that, you know, now's the right time for it. Yeah. So, so I, I guess like still comparing like, you know, TradFi versus this space, like, can you break down how, like, how's the traditional index structure? Like, let's stay away from the, the SPY ETF and just go to the S&P 500 at the base layer. Like, what is the typical construct for that, for the index providers? And, you know, how do they make money and c compare that, I guess, to how Alongside is doing it? Totally. And I think this is like one misnomer too, that most people don't realize and most people don't have to realize, right? Is that like, you can't buy the S&P 500, you buy index that track the S&P 500. So that's like the first major distinction is you've got an organization like S&P or MSCI or CRSP that's ultimately creating the methodology that underpins what these indexes track. Um, and generally speaking, you know, those are charging a pretty hefty chunk of the expense ratio that those funds take in. So generally speaking, it's someone in the order of about 30% accrues to that third party that created the benchmark. And then, you know, an index issuer, uh, maybe a BlackRock or Vanguard or State Street is going to in-license that benchmark to create their index product. And so I think that's one thing that, you know, people tend to misinterpret. 
Um, you know, as far as how index products make money, I think this is another sort of underexplored thing, which is that most people look at, you know, uh, an index maybe in the brokerage account and they see an expense ratio. And on its surface, they see, you know, that is, oh, okay, that makes sense. That's how the issuer makes money. And, you know, practically speaking, that's a rounding error relative, generally speaking, relative to what they're generally making in things like, um, you know, securities lending. So under the hood, most of those products that maybe charge single digit BIPs, um, you know, as index funds, ultimately make, you know, 20 to 40, sometimes more in you know, lending those assets in the back end of that. And, you know, most, you know, purchasers of those products have no idea that that's the dynamic. And so there's this idea that the expense ratio is where all the value capture happens. It's actually not. Um, in crypto, this is interesting because, you know, there aren't really robust enough markets for at least all assets to do off-chain, you know, lending of non-securities, right? We saw every, you know, third party that was engaged in that kind of blow up over the course of last year. But you've got amazing stuff like Compound that just does that on-chain and, you know, can kind of do that immediately and do it, you know, in a much more transparent fashion. So I think, you know, one of the bigger lessons learned looking at index products over the last 50 years is that you will see fee compression. I think it's no different here. I tend to think that like your end consumer doesn't want to pay anything in expense ratio. Like I liken the psychological uh, aspect of that almost to like the way people think about paying for shipping. Uh, people hate it was the real preference is that people would rather overpay for a product than pay for shipping. I think expense ratios, you know, psychologically have a lot of those same mechanics, but you know, for good reason, right? Like the compounding of those expense ratios over time are really deleterious towards someone's returns. And so we should drive that effectively to zero. So our intent is basically to do just that. Um, you've seen, you know, TradFi players like Fidelity come out with zero fee products. I think we could do the same thing. I think the biggest distinction is the construction of those. And so if you look under the hood of how, you know, an index fund actually operates, you've got things like benchmark construction that do take, uh, you know, a good chunk of that. Then you've got custody, which frankly, you know, in TradFi rounds to zero. Um, you know, you've got things like distribution that, you know, the end user is in effect paying for. And that was like Vanguard's whole thesis was, you know, we're going to keep the fee low. We're going to let consumers be the evangelist for us. I look at Vanguard as like this perfect proxy because in a lot of ways, they're like the 20th century version of a company that progressively decentralized in that, you know, holders of Vanguard funds own Vanguard. And that created this circular kind of incentive design where holders of those products weren't incented to raise fees on themselves. And so I think, you know, there are a lot of mechanics and things that we're lucky to kind of stand on the shoulders of. And, you know, we're really just trying to bring that similar dynamic uh, to crypto asset markets. And I think that lends itself to one better, cheaper, faster, uh, you know, and more transparent index products. So can you break that apart a little bit like the Vanguard, you know, versus maybe some other mutual fund that has a, you know, an army of distributors out there through financial advisors or whatever network it might be? Like, I think that that's a, a subtle, um, you know, market structure misunderstanding that a lot of people don't really realize how impactful that is when it when it flows through to the bottom line of somebody's retirement account or for their brokerage account. Can you just kind of like pick that apart a bit? Totally. So, you know, a lot of people question, like when we describe ourselves as like the, at least the intent being to build a decentralized Vanguard, Vanguard is number two as it stands right now. And so, you know, are we stupid? We don't want to be number two, right? Our thought process is actually like, you know, in a world where you've got completely transparent finance, the best product, and oftentimes that means the lowest fee product is ultimately the winner. And if you look at inflows, you know, even in equity markets over the course of the last 10 years, Vanguard has been sort of the dominant capturer of those inflows. And I think over time, you know, ultimately wins the day. But the, the strategy that was employed in the 20th century was, you know, BlackRock would, might say, OK, we're going to charge higher fees and we're going to devote that, you know, excess cash flow to these massive sales teams and massive distribution that, in effect, holders of their products are paying for. Right. And, you know, Vanguard actually grew really slow for a really long part of, period of time. Like few people know this, but like they had basically 20 years of wilderness. And, you know, part of the strategy was we're not going to employ these massive sales teams to stuff all these products in every, you know, pension fund or 401k product we can. Instead, we're going to build the best product and that, you know, is going to be the cheapest one. And ultimately, you know, that's going to win the day. Now, you know, back to kind of where we're at uh, on chain, I think that same dynamic applies where, you know, it's ultimately the product that is the lowest fee that, you know, is most useful as a composable asset. And so, you know, I believe in a world where you've got completely transparent finance, the opacity that, you know, sort of won the day in the last century doesn't win. And, you know, so our thought process is, you know, we want to employ that same strategy of we're going to keep fees low and, you know, continue to drive those as low as possible. 
in the effort of ultimately being, you know, the primitive that people use to track, at least in, in the case of our first product, the whole market. Yeah. And I think Tony Robbins was the catalyst for me as I was kind of like reading some personal finance books back, you know, in, in high school or early days of college. And, you know, what was amazing to me was, you know, as I started to get into the workforce and had a 401k, it's just the lack of investable options that were available to me. And then you know, if you lift under the hood, what you don't realize, and to your point, like this is all flowing back to the end user or the customer who is trying to save for 30, 40 years for, for retirement. They're just chipping away at fees in order to subsidize the provider of those funds to be on the shelf of the 401k. So therefore, you're kind of locked into this walled garden. Um, of, of, of investable options. And instead of having a broad market, you know, uh, access where you can discern, you know, which fund manager, which strategy you want to invest in, you oftentimes don't have that. And so I think, you know, if you kind of go back to, um, you know, the, the first principles of DeFi, right, it's access and openness that is not similar to the traditional finance market where you have all of these either walled gardens on purpose that are set up because of the economic arrangement that's in place, or you're effectively paying for these distribution armies um, versus, you know, putting the power into the hands of the people. And that's kind of where, where crypto is heading. So it's super interesting to see, um, you know, the contrast between the two, but we haven't really kind of talked about AMKT specifically. So like what goes into building AMKT? What is, what is the strategy? What are the holdings? Like how do you mechanically actually stitch this all together? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, it sounds stupid. There is no strategy, right? Like uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the strategy is to basically be a mirror to the market as much as humanly possible. And so, you know, I might have individual opinions about specific protocols and, and you know, whether any of these tokens are going to accrue value. But, you know, those aren't expressed in this product. Our goal is to be, you know, totally objective and, you know, give you just market exposure. And so, you know, functionally how that works right now, with our existing product, uh, is you get exposure to the top 25 assets in crypto uh, by market cap, circulating supply market cap. And, you know, that if you backtest it uh, over the last several years, you know, tracks with the growth of the you know, total market cap of the, the space, you know, at about 97% track efficiency. And so it does give you that broad based exposure. And, you know, really our goal is to just give you, uh, you know, one token that tracks the whole market. So, you know, we're not tilting our hands on the scales of which assets should ultimately be in it. Um, you know, really, I think that the goal is just to, you know, be a, a set of rules. And, you know, kind of the platonic ideal of what we're building towards is to basically turn the entire you know, administration of an index fund into just self-executing code that is predictable and, you know, ultimately is just based on a set of rules. And is that all transparent? Like, can I lift under the hood and see what the logic is for reconstitution or rebalancing of the index based off of like whatever rules that you've programmed into it? Yep. So that's all in our docs. Um, you know, there are things like proof of reserves, uh, power buyer partners at chain length that look at, you know, the holdings at any given point and the weights. Um, so yeah, the, the goal for that is just to be completely transparent. Um, you know, I think one of the interesting things about how this works in traditional financial markets is that it tends not to be. So, you know, methodologies are published and that's clear, but things like the committees that oversee, uh, you know, asset inclusion are really unclear. Um, so I believe the S and P committee is something like, uh, you know, eight people, but there's only one that's actually visible that you're aware of. And like, they're all at S&P. Um, and so I think that, you know, our goal is to, to just make that process, you know, way more open and transparent than it, it, it already is. And predictable at the same time too, on inclusion and exclusion from the index. Um, okay. So how do you think about marketing and growing AMKT? You know, we, we, we talked about the BlackRock strategy and, you know, there's just a whole network of financial advisors and in intermediaries, wholesalers, even that are distributing these funds to different platforms. So how do you go about, um, you know, growing market share with AMKT? And also with that, can you talk about, you know, where is the growth of AMKT today? You know, I know you crossed a, a big milestone in terms of holders. And, and so just love to know some of those metrics. Totally. So I'll give you kind of the, the short term and then, you know, the perhaps naive version of where I think this is all headed in the long term. Um, you know, kind of in the immediate term, like we really want to lean into the fact that we are an ERC-20 token. And, you know, that means that it can be composable across a number of different protocols, hopefully sometime soon, things like Compound. I think that, you know, of course, our goal is to sort of message the uh, ethos of kind of long term, you know, dollar cost averaging. But, you know, the, the benefits of having a, a token that lives on Ethereum is people can do whatever they want with it, right? And so it could be used as a, you know, money Lego to go design a strategy that maybe enables you to short the market, right? Mm. Like, there's no shortage of demand for that, unfortunately. Sure. Um, 
you know, I'm personally not huge on stuff like leverage. Also totally possible if you are, that you want to get two, three X leverage against uh, you know, that market exposure. And so, you know, as we think about it right now, we really want to lean into the fact that there are all these incredible protocols that this could get, you know, syndicated across that could enable someone to express a variety of different positions through the same vehicle. Mm-hmm. So, you know, looking at things like the Spider ETF, there's inspiration around this. Like one of the things I find fascinating there is, you know, outwardly, there's this, there's this positioning that it is the you know, thing to buy and hold. And plenty of people do that. People also use it as a vehicle uh, to speculate on an intraday basis. And so it's this great, very liquid asset that if you look at, um, you know, sort of equity volumes tends to be, you know, among the most highly traded assets in any given day, because it's used as a vehicle for traders to express positions on an intraday basis. And so, you know, we think one thing that's really interesting about just being on chain, which is naturally, um, you know, uh, you know, open and global is that, you know, people can express whatever position they want on top of it. And so we really want to lean into that. Um, you know, kind of zooming out to the longer term, I think that, you know, right now we play in the sandbox of the, you know, $1 trillion, give or take, you know, crypto asset market. I think at a long enough time horizon, you will see all these other asset classes live on chain in some way, shape or form. And so I don't know the timeline for that, uh, you know, perhaps naively, I think it'll happen, you know, inside of call it a decade. But, you know, our goal is to see this other $100 trillion plus end up living on chain and be able to construct products, uh, you know, that also involve those asset classes and, you know, be able to slice and dice them in ways that, you know, you otherwise couldn't in traditional equity markets. Yeah, absolutely. And have external managers that kind of build their thematic ETFs or not ETFs, sorry, but strategies through the, the platform that you're building um, will be, you know, a, a great unlock for others to express those types of uh, opportunities and you know, then compose that into all the different protocols out there. Where where is AKT living in the wild today? Like, if you're an investor that's wanting to get this type of exposure, how do you get access to it? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, easiest way uh, you know for those that are comfortable on chain is just through Uniswap, and um, you know, we recently integrated with a, a protocol called Bungie that's really good for kind of getting cross chain. Um, assets, you know, into AMKT. So if you've got assets on Optimism, you can very easily swap into AMKT on Arbitrum, for example. Um, so really excited about that. And then, of course, you know, a whole variety of different wallets that people are using. I mean, I think our goal is just to make it as easy as possible to get access to. So Rainbow, Zerion, Zengo, um, you know, the, the slate of wallets that I think are, are pretty accessible for people to use. And then, you know, centralized exchanges like Gate uh, are currently available. And then one of the things that we're excited to see more of is activity where people are kind of using AMKT as an asset within a vault that maybe has, you know, a totally different strategy. So last week we launched uh, a product in Arbitrum that lets you kind of pair trade between specific assets. So for example, if you think that uh, there's this common narrative in, in crypto where it's alt season and like you see a rotation out of Bitcoin and Ethereum into the rest of the market, you can express that position, um, you know, kind of through this pairs product that we created. And so really excited to see more uh, kind of innovation take place at the top of what we've already built. Yeah, then that's really cool. And, I, you know, this this I'm sure comes up in all of your conversations with investors. But um, how do you think about the regulatory landscape around a product like this? How does yep. that impact, you know, the, the, the setup and the access and, you know, any of the, you know, uh, decisions that you guys have to make as a team in order to um, grow and expand this opportunity for anybody that wants to get access to it? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think you, you raise a point like the, the between the lines version is like, you know, if you couldn't access, you know, U.S. equity markets uh, because you were in a, a you know, state that you know, ultimately didn't have access to U.S. equity markets over the course of the last 50, 100 years, you were basically totally boxed out from vehicles that actually let you save. Right. Like you're, you're you know, weren't actually saving if you were just you know, sitting in whatever your local fiat currency may have been. Um, and so I think it's really important for these products to just be global in nature. And, you know, that's one of the things that we've seen to date. And I think that represents a whole new set of challenges, I think, for, for products like ours is like, you know, we tend to focus on, on U.S. Uh, and the U.S.'s sort of regulatory apparatus. And truthfully, you know, you could die a death by a thousand cuts of like trying to work with every regulator across the world that might regulate it differently. And, you know, our real goal is just to, you know, turn this into self-executing code that is just totally unreliant on humans being a loop that, you know, ultimately is going to perform like code where it's just very predictable. And so, you know, everything is, is totally open and out there. You know how something is going to play out. I think that's one of the benefits of, uh, you know, crypto protocols is, you know, you have a good sense of where things are going to land, like compound held up the last year of, uh, you know, off-chain liquidations. 
Um, and so that's really the intent. And then I think, you know, in a lot of ways, like we think that there are ways to actually innovate on compliance on chain. So, you know, I, I think the upshot of a lot of this is that like everything is naturally way more transparent. That is better than the standards that we have today. And that's one thing I think, you know, I'd love to see U.S. regulators, you know, lean into quite a bit is that, in fact, like there are ways to, um, you know, be more transparent on chain than we ever could off chain. So perfect example of this, right? Like, you know, uh, if we were trading like a regular stock, you know, we would be required to have all sorts of disclosures that are really only updated on a pretty infrequent basis. And then, you know, you're really reliant on a third party to ultimately say audit those financials. And, you know, that's not a perfect system. Whereas, you know, on chain, you might have a sleuth that discovered something at four in the morning and, you know, can write a thread up about it and ultimately uncover an issue with, you know, whatever you're doing. And so I actually think that, you know, on-chain compliance will be better than off-chain compliance on a long enough arc. And I'm really excited to see people play around with different things that they could do on that front. So, you know, one example that we've tried out is when you buy MKT, you are actually delivered a uh, prospectus equivalent on-chain. So mm -hmm. you, uh, over Polygon, end up getting a set of risk factors and disclosures that are not inconsistent with, you know, what you might see in equity markets. Now, you know, that being said, like we kind of invented that, nobody asked for it, and I don't know that anybody really wants it. Um, and I don't know that we'll be rewarded for it, but I think directionally it's the type of thing that we want to try to figure out is how can you do compliance on chain in a way that's actually better? Um, and then I think, you know, frankly, like it, it does, like, you know, assets being on chain does disintermediate a lot of the functions that, you know, are required. Um, and so a lot of the areas where, you know, we created regulations to prevent human error if, uh, you know, that error is reduced to code, well, there's a different set of risk factors to, you know, insure against. Um, and so, you know, that might look like making sure that, uh, you know, your protocol has been audited multiple times, or there's an ongoing bug bounty program where people can poke holes in that code. But, you know, most of the regulatory apparatus, I think, was designed to prevent, you know, human error and corruption. Um, and I think that, you know, many of these systems on chain can do that in a way where there isn't human error or corruption. Um, but that, of course, is like a you know idealistic view. Things aren't perfect, but uh, I do think that's where things are headed. Yeah, no, it's great to hear. I mean, you know, everybody gets delivered a ninety to one hundred page prospectus every time that they buy a mutual fund, and that information is accessible. But it's oftentimes buried, um, you know, for investors and folks oftentimes don't leverage the great resources that are there to, before making a decision on a particular investment. And, and even if you did that, you know, to your point earlier about some of the uh, inner workings of indexes and, and these funds of securities lending and, and other types of economics that kind of go into the expense ratio are not that transparent. That's the kind of stuff that you can really disrupt by putting it all on chain um, and being able to see the exposures in real time and understand the constitution of the, of the index and how all of that operates without having to, you know, go through a hundred page document and see that on an infrequent basis. It's in real time right there in front of your eyes. So uh, massive improvement from a transparency and efficiency perspective that um, is ripe for disruption. So glad to see that you guys are, are marching forward on that front. I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, I think our goal is really to, you know, very much reduce the amount of discretion that goes into products like this. And there's this amazing study that I always cite. Uh, there's this economist out of Columbia that, that uh, you know, did this study to really solve for two things. One um, was, you know, are benchmarks corruptible, right? And, you know, this was the question that we had is like, are is the, you know, benchmark calculation and, you know, inputs that go into that, is that actually something that like struggles because it's centralized, right? And like, I originally was thinking, oh, like, no, right? It, it's, uh, you know, sort of a solution in search of a problem. Actually, it's a really big problem. So perfect example of this is, you know, inclusion of, you know, things like Tesla, in the S&P 500 or in ESG funds, where I believe it was 2020, um, you know, Tesla, you know, for the longest time, S&P had criteria around profitability, where you know right. all companies were required to have, I believe, two quarters of uh, you know cash flow positivity and and you know be profitable. And you know, over that period of time, I want to say Tesla grew from like a you know 100 billion dollar market cap to like a 600 billion dollar market cap or something insane. Numbers, big error bars. But, you know, they did turn a profit and then, you know, the S&P committee kind of dragged their feet around including Tesla in the S&P 500. And by the time it was basically a foregone conclusion, everyone had kind of front run that trade. It ended up being like the fifth largest component, the S&P 500. And everyone that, you know, held products that tracked the S&P 500, myself included, were kind of left as a bag holder in, the, in, in you know, some capacity. And if you look at things like the Vanguard Total Market product, which, you know, does not have the same profitability criteria, there was major outperformance that year. 
Um, and so, you know, I do think that you actually, you know, this equates to tens of billions of dollars in, you know, issues tied to the fact that that process is a bit centralized. The other thing this study looked at was are, um, you know, inclusion in these indexes purchasable. So they looked at Moody's as a control and found that basically companies that were maybe on the bubble of being included in the S&P 500 would um, purchase ratings from S&P at a higher rate. Hmm. And if you look at the underpinnings of the S&P 500, he discovered that maybe somewhere in the order of about 40% of the assets that are included in the S&P 500 ultimately are added with discretion. So it's decided by that committee to include that asset. And you know, what does that mean for that company? The cost of capital is lower. They obviously have in inflows into their uh, stocks that come from the forced buying of these products. And so you know, companies want this. They buy uh, S&P ratings in excess of when they're uh, buying you know, Moody's ratings that doesn't have a, a benchmark that it's tied to. And one of the things that they discovered was that something like 40% of these assets uh, are added discretionarily. If you look at the composition of assets that were added with discretion versus the ones that were just added with rules entirely, the ones that were added with rules outperform the, the set that was added with discretion. Mm -hmm. And so it turns out like the centralization of this benchmark calculation is actually a real problem. And it's kind of insidious because it's like very much under the hood and nobody really thinks about it. I mean, there must be an entire industry of active managers that just do index ARB all the time. For those yeah. Yeah. Tons. Yeah. I mean, like this is where trading is totally profitable, right? It's like, right. you know, doing, you know, things like index ARB, uh, you know, all the uh, big brains at Jane Street have figured stuff like that out. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, it's a fascinating Fascinating lift under the hood that I don't think a lot of people appreciate. And yet trillions of dollars are tracking that on a daily basis. So um, there's a massive impact for uh, disrupting <laughs> that process and making it more objective and less subjective. So um, really interesting insights. Uh, any takeaways or closing thoughts? I know we covered a lot of ground there. Totally. I mean, I think just to take a step back, I think that like one criticism of our own product and, you know, what I work on day in, day out is that it contributes to this idea that like most of crypto is, is finance. And I think that's like one very small use case in the grand scheme of things. And, you know, I think, you know, back to the regulatory conversation, why it's so in the crosshairs is this perception that it's just, you know, trying to disrupt financial markets. Practically speaking, I think there are a whole host of things that, you know, crypto enables that in my mind just look like a better internet. And, you know, our product is effectively, you know, a proxy for the growth of the whole category. But I do think that, uh, you know, on some level, it contributes to the idea that this is just about financial products as really not. Right. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm really excited, uh, you know, really just to extol the virtues of are the things that, you know, go beyond DeFi and go beyond financial applications, beyond money that exist on crypto rails that I think, you know, people are very, um, you know, unaware of or, you know, not thinking of as much. You could like basically pull from the headlines every major issue over the course of the last 10 years. So things like, you know, data privacy and, you know, centralized social networks, you know, being in control of your data, that theoretically can be solved on chain. And I think a lot of people, you know, aren't, have, haven't woken up to that yet. Um, and I do think that, you know, that's one thing that, uh, you know, I feel like it's important to kind of extol uh, the virtues of. Yeah, no, I think it's really important to mention. And, you know, when you kind of take a step back and look at the landscape of the, all the different sectors that are being built in Web3 and in the crypto space, whether it's social, whether it's gaming, DeFi, you name it, stable coins, currencies, like there's so many different aspects to this entire space. And so, yeah, having broad exposure to it is great to uh, plant your seeds on the overall growth of the market. But as you break up those different verticals into thematic exposures, that'll be really interesting because right now the only way to do that is to individually select, you know, certain assets in a particular basket um, on your own and no kind of product that will allow you to do so unless you're an accredited investor and you can get into a VC fund that, <laughs> that, is, spe that is specifically focused on a particular one of those areas. And that is not um, accessible to everybody that wants to get that type of exposure in their portfolio. So that'll be really cool to see the evolution of alongside take this and, and, and run with it. So really appreciate you sharing all of these thoughts. Um, we'll have to have you back again as you continue to expand the platform and add more products, but, um, really want to appreciate it. Say thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, you can listen and subscribe to compound thesis on YouTube, Apple, or Spotify. If you like today's show, go ahead, share it with a friend and stay tuned for our next episode. Thanks again, Austin. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks everybody for listening. Have a good one.